Good afternoon, everyone. Let's have a Bible class. What do you say? Turn to Titus chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 4. Titus 3 and Ephesians 4. And we've come a long way in this discussion of how we go about getting the first six books that Paul wrote tied together with the last seven books that Paul wrote and to show the differences in between and to show the sameness of it all and on and on and on. So uh, we're going to talk about two or three things uh, uh, throughout the whole hour here today. Uh, but specifically, I want you to notice that uh, in, we're going to look in Titus 3 now. And um, notice he says in verse 4 of Titus 3, he says, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, comma, but I want, to, I want to reinsert something that is not in chapter 3. It's in chapter 2. There, these are the two passages in the book of Titus that I believe they are, they are like the, they are the captivity of the whole, whole thrust of the Lord in the, all 13 books Paul wrote. Look in chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Think about that as a capstone passage for the entire work of Paul's epistles. All 13 epistles are wrapped up in those three verses right there. That's why he's done it. That's why the Lord did it. It's the purpose of God for all of eternity to have the church, which is his body, Christ's body, that, that, that we are going to stand in the glory of Christ in that body, as in Colossians 3. It all rolls up into right, that right there. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It didn't start out to all men. It started out to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But now, in, its, in total, in its entirety, it goes to all men everywhere, under any circumstance, anywhere, at any time, for any purpose. All you have to do is trust what Christ did for you. Now go back to chapter 3 and pick up that verse again, verse 4. But after the kindness, uh, after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, he said that Christ died for our sins. He said that he was buried, and he said that he was raised again for our justification. When the Lord said those words, that personified verse 4, 5, and 6. The regeneration happened in Jesus Christ. We've not yet been regenerated. I wouldn't have a back hurt right, hurt right now from having played golf on Friday if I had been regenerated. People want to argue about, well, you must be born again. Yes, you must be to get into heaven, to the kingdom of God, to the kingdom of his glory, to the kingdom of God's dear son, and the kingdom of God upon the earth. You must be born again. What's that mean? Born a second time. And it's called right here in this passage, regeneration. Jesus Christ has been regenerated. Wow. We've got Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory. We're in Christ. He's in us. Now, I want you to hold on to Titus 1, 2, and 3, and go back with me now to Ephesians chapter 4. I want to make sure we understand Titus but I want to make sure we understand how come Paul wrote Ephesians after he wrote Titus. In other words, if I put the way I, the way I believe Paul wrote these last seven books is Philippians chapter one, uh, verse one there. I mean, Philippians first, and then Colossians, and then Philemon, and then first Timothy, Titus, then Ephesians. And then 2 Timothy. Now, here's the thing. He wrote Ephesians to a bunch of people just like you and me. 
Oh, yes, the Colossians were like you and me, but the Colossians were in association with Philemon, who was more like one of the early people. The Philippians started out as part of the early people. But now when he writes Ephesians, he writes Ephesians just after he writes the book of Titus. Titus is a Gentile from the get-go, and Ephesians is the epitome of writing, a, writing the doctrine of the Lord to people like you and me, Gentiles of the world. And of course, now in this era of these seven books having been written, everyone is considered a Gentile before the Lord until they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in Ephesians 4, he says in verse 1, I therefore, uh, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation. So I'm going to say here uh, that Ephesians has to do with, with walking worthy. And I know you can find that in other books. You can find it in 1 Thessalonians right over here. Same In the same manner almost. So you got it in Ephesians, you got it back there. How about if we just figure out how to walk worthy then? How about that? And it wouldn't make any difference where we were born into this world and therefore came into the body of Christ at whatever level, whether it be Acts chapter 11 or Acts chapter 16 or 2022. Wouldn't make any difference. We're gonna, we gotta figure out a way that we can walk worthy of what has been given to us free. And I'm telling you now, I, I know that that's not a part of salvation. So just don't write me letters. You know what I know about that. And I'll get back to you in a moment about it. But you see, here we are in Titus and we're looking at what, what is joined up with, side by side with, and, and for the purpose of understanding how to walk worthy, okay? Now, I usually get more comments when I write about the, the uh, working habits of a saved individual than I, do, than I do any other thing that I get comments about. You know what, folks? The Apostle Paul wrote a whole lot more scripture about working for the Lord's sake than he did about doctrine. He did about all these differences. We emphasize the differences because we don't want to take somebody else's promises from God's word. We want the promises from God's word to go to the people that God directed them to. Amen. So what we've got here then is a way that we can see how we who don't deserve a thing, we who don't know anything about how to serve the Lord, about how to walk according to the dictates of a righteous law, we don't know anything about that. How then do we serve the Lord? Look at verse 1 again. Ephesians 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. In other words, forbearing, by the way, means put up with, no matter what they are. You know, we used to have a Bible camp, and, and uh, it was almost like a, it was almost like a, a a uh, mixing bowl of people every summer about who would be there. There would be the same people. You know, like in a, in a mixing, uh, in a bowl of lettuce, you've got, uh, you've got scads of green stuff, you know, lettuce and whatever else, so what are those other green things are you break up into lettuce. So there we all are. That's the regular people at a Bible camp. And then sometimes on your salad, you've got pieces of, of cherry tomatoes scattered around. Other times you have pieces of chopped up tomatoes, which is a lot more sloppy. Well, we had people show up at Bible camp that were fastidious, and others show up that were just, you know, little boy said to us one time, he said, I haven't had a, I haven't taken a shower since I've been here. And we said, we all, we all said, we know that. We could tell. He says, well, I can't take a shower down there. He said, why not? So, well, the water's cold. So, well, everybody else takes a shower in cold water. He says, yeah, but they make fun of me. And there's a man standing there said, I'm going to take you down there and give you a shower. And he said, no, I'm going. I'll go do one. We well, came back up, up to the, the uh, uh, tabernacle after a while, and his clothes were wet. And his hair was wet. He said, you take a shower? He said, yeah. He said, why are your pants wet? He said, well, I didn't take them off. <laughs> he just took sloppy tomatoes on the salad right there. Then we'd have, you know, a little, we'd have cheese 
on our, we put cheese on our salad. And cheese is sometimes, it's, it's like little strings of cheese. Sometimes it's ground up cheese. Sometimes you don't get any cheese at all. You wish you had some. Well, there's people like that. They're sticky. They hang around. They don't do much. Then there's sometimes you put nuts on your salad. Well, I'm not telling you we had a camp, Bible camp full of nuts, but you know, the occasional. You know. Anyway, and then comes dressing. The dressing comes on. The salad is being built. All the green stuff is there. That's the people that come all the time. They're always there. But sometimes we had these kind of tomatoes, and sometimes we had these. Sometimes we had these kind of nuts, and sometimes we had these kind of nuts. Sometimes we had some salad dressing that was just horrible tasting, and sometimes it would be so sweet, and sometimes it would be vinegary, and sometimes it would be mayonnaise-like, and on and on and on the people come. In that Bible camp, we would find it difficult to teach Bible lessons along these lines endeavoring to find the way we could walk worthy of the Lord. So we did a lot of preaching the gospel, which is what we're supposed to do anyway. And we did a lot of rightly dividing the word of truth, which is what we're supposed to do anyway. And so a lot of people would go away from 10 days of Bible camp and they'd think, well, geez, you know, well nobody said a word about how we should live. Well, that don't change anything about the scripture. There's still more scripture about how you should live as a saved individual than there is about becoming a saved individual. And if you don't think I'm right about that, just start counting the verses. That'll do it for you. Now, <clears throat> notice he says in verse three here, he says, in, in light of the fact that we have to be long-suffering, we have to be low, we have to low, have a lowly mind and meek and, and filled with meekness. And we have to be long-suffering, and we have to forbear one another, which put up with one another in love. And so inside, all, inside of all that, besides all that, verse 3 says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Endeavoring to keep it, not make it. You can't make it. The Lord already made it. So we got, we got a verse, we got three verses here that are going to tell us what the unity of the Spirit is. That's the Holy Spirit. You know, that's a capital S. So there they are, verse 4, 5, and 6. There's one body. There's one spirit, even as you're called in one hope. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all who's above all and through all and in you all. Amen? Amen. Enough said? No. That's just the start of it. It's not enough said. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. Now he goes through some things here, and then he comes down to the point where he's telling us about what he has given, what are the gifts that have been given to the church, the body of Christ. We'll start at verse 11. He gave to some apostles. Now, here's the deal about an apostle. An apostle is somebody who is a carrier. The word means carrier or, or carried over. And an apostle is a carrier of a message. He gets a message from the Lord, and he carries it, and he speaks it, and he speaks it. And he speaks it. And he spends his life speaking that message. Going, going, going. But he gets it from the Lord. Well, we've got a completed word of God. We don't have any apostles today. We've got repeaters today. They show up in another category here. <clears throat> and it says the next category, he says, is some prophets. Well, a prophet, he, he unfolds something. That is a future picture. Hasn't happened yet, or something that might have happened already and is going to happen again. In other words, he makes un people understand, the prophet is going to make people understand that the Lord has shown him a thing that is going to show up sometime. Sometimes it's specific, sometimes it's uh, you can count up the days, sometimes it, it's a total mystery. And if you ever read Daniel chapter 9, and I recommend you do. But if you've ever read chapter Daniel chapter 9, you'll see one of the most beautiful prayers you ever saw written down. It is Daniel praying unto the Lord. The Lord's answer to Daniel is to send Gabriel down and tell him what's going to happen to Israel. A great prophecy. Now, you probably won't get the clear picture of that prophecy from Daniel 9. 
So if you want to study that prophecy, then I suggest you study about seven other books in the Old Testament and watch how the Lord puts that all together for you to see it. And then you can find some of it in Matthew, you can find some of it in Luke, and you can find some of it in Paul's epistles, and you can find some of it in Peter's epistles. Wow. Such a thing, this prophecy. But you see, here's the thing. Once the prophet has spoken it or written it, they may not even be a prophet again. Check Amos out. He'll tell you that. Now, here's the thing. Those are apostles and prophets. Since we have all of the word of God written down, and we have the promise of one who had been given a message, an apostle to bring forth, who said that God had given him a dispensation of time to fulfill the word of God, that's Paul, then we've got all Paul wrote, and we've got all that everybody else wrote, so we've got all the word of God. Amen? Yes, we do. I appreciate all those amens. Thousands of you said amen right there. So there are some people in the body of Christ received apostles. Some people in the body of Christ received prophets. There's prophets that show up during the book of Acts. But then you come to the other three. He says, and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, here's the deal about becoming an evangelist. No one is born an evangelist. Like uh, somebody was answering on Facebook a while ago about saying that no one is born filled with the Spirit of God. That's true. No one is born filled with the Spirit of God. All of us are born fashioned like our mother and father, and therefore we were conceived in sin and born in sin. That we had not sinned, nor had we broken any innocence. Yeah, that's true. But there's a day coming in everyone's life when that's no longer true and sin is present with us. See, when we found there was a law, Sin was present. That's what Romans chapter six, five, six, and seven is going to show us more than anything else. Now, here's the thing, folks. That being the case, someone becomes an evangelist because they hear. H-E-A-R. They hear. They hear how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, was buried, and was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. In the hearing of that, they hear, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And when they hear that, they hear it from somebody, they hear it from some mechanism like a radio or TV or a com computer screen, or they read it in a pamphlet and they hear it with their ears, even though they're reading it off the words of a page. It's like the words of the gospel of Christ are going to leap off the page at somebody. And when you hear it, then you can trust it. He, he, he that was delivered for us up for us all, how shall God not freely give us with him all things comes to mind. And he said in, in uh, Romans chapter 4, he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Therefore, being, being therefore uh, justified by faith, we have peace with God. Oh. oh. So the evangelist hears that, sees that truth, and seizes the truth, takes a hold of it, and he gets it going in his mind, and he knows, I got to repeat this. I got to repeat this. I got to repeat this. And so he goes and tells everybody. And so he tells the first guy, it takes him a minute and a half. And the guy says, yeah, all right. He goes on down the road. But he learns how to talk to him. He learns how to walk up to him and say, have you ever heard the greatest news that the world has ever had come to it? Or some such thing as that. Or he walks up to him and, and he says, if you died right now, where would you go and why would you go there? Like Brother Barry Hampton used to do. Jan Wilburn has one of the greatest three-minute speeches you ever heard anybody do. He uses, he uses a scrap piece of paper or a napkin in a restaurant and shows people salvation on that. It's a great evangelical tool. And so our man earns, learns how to do that. And he learns how to say the word so that somebody can hear the word of truth, the gospel, their salvation, believe it, and trust Christ as their Savior. He's an evangelist. And there are many. Probably not enough. We need more of them. 
We need more out on the streets right now and on and on. We need more in the, in the marketplace. We need more in our workplaces. We need more in schools and on and on. We need evangelists. Lord, may we have more evangelists. I don't know anyone, that any saved individual who has been less of a good evangelist than me. I've never been good. I would talk to people about being saved, and I don't know if they get saved or not. That's not up to me, and I don't try to count them. But I never feel like I did it right. I always go away thinking, I should have said this. I should have said, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And on and on it goes. I second guess myself all the time. That's not going to make me a good evangelist. A good evangelist learns what to say, says it, and learns how to repeat it. And yeah, he will adjust according to who he's talking to, whether he's talking to a 16-year-old, whether he's talking to two girls, two boys, or an 85-year-old grandmother, or a 95-year-old lady who knows that she's got, got many days left, or whoever he might be talking to. He's going to talk slightly different to them, but he's always going to be that evangelist. He's, he's evangelizing. He's putting out the effort like an angel of God speaking the words that God wants him to say. Evangelist. And then it says, and some pastors and teachers. So along comes pastors and teachers. And I, I believe all pastors are teachers, even though I don't believe all teachers are pastors. But we need those. We need the pastors. We need the teachers. Some people seem to have, when you meet them, you know right away they have a heart to be a pastor. A heart to be a pastor means he'll listen to anybody's problems. He will deal with them on the way the Bible tells him to. He won't pull any punches. He won't take any advantage of them. He won't spread their bad news across the countryside. And he will always leave it in the hands of the Lord to solve the problem. That's what a good pastor does. Leaves it in the hands of the Lord to solve the problem. Now, as a teacher, he may take all of those things that happen to him or that he gets involved in, put them into a scripture mode and stand up and teach a lesson about it without ever mentioning a name. Now, sometimes he has permission to mention names and sometimes that's valuable, sometimes it's not, but a pastor soon learns how to do that. A pastor also shows people in some way, shape or form how, by teaching them, he shows them how to give their testimony. In other words, everybody's got, everybody that's saved, every individual that has trusted Christ as their Savior has words in their mouth that will come out about their own testimony that will be the greatest words they could speak to anyone. Anyone. Now, when I say that, I'm talking about the idea that you and I have things to say that are valuable for the Lord. If we belong to the Lord, we have valuable things to say to, to the people around us that come to us from the Lord. When I give my testimony of salvation, it's like this. I was raised in a strict religious home, separate Baptist, which means they, they believe you can lose your salvation, whatever. If you sin, you've lost it. If you do other certain things, you're on the road to hell and on and on and on. Well, at 22, I was stubborn against that. I did, if you'd asked me if I was going to, what would happen in a diet, I would have told you I was going to hell because I knew I was not saved by what I'd learned. And yet one night at age 22, being terribly frustrated about the job I was on, being overwhelmed by the job that I was on, fighting with my wife about whether or not we should even go to church or where to go to church, she went to bed. I sat there alone in the dark for a while, got up and went to the bathroom, fell to my knees and asked the Lord to save me. I trusted Christ. I knew who Christ was. I knew that there wasn't any other hope except Christ. And I trusted Christ to save me because I asked him to. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved was the only verse I knew that night. And I trusted Christ as my Savior. Later on, I learned many other things. But that was my salvation story. Now, I don't know if you timed that, but that's about a minute and 40 seconds. Here's the thing, folks. You can give your testimony in two minutes or less. I believe that's very important. I believe it's important not only to do it, it's important to know that you can do it. And if it, if it takes standing in front of a mirror and practicing until you get it down to two minutes, under two minutes, because when you talk to strangers or people who are not really interested in hearing your testimony, you've got about two minutes and you can do that. And a pastor will show people 
how to give their testimony. He'll teach them the scripture that shows them how to give their testimony. That's one of, one of the things that a pastor does. So he's a good teacher. A teacher may go long and hard on teaching the difference between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, between Romans and between Ephesians, uh, the Romans and Ephesians, or between 1 Corinthians and the book of uh, Colossians. You can show those differences, or 2 Corinthians and uh, Philippians, like we've been doing here, making comparisons and, and contrasting and so on and so forth. That's teaching. I believe in teachers. The best Bible teacher I've ever seen in my entire life was E.C. Moore. A whole gob of people come in a really good, strong second. I could name 15 or 20 that I learn from all the time. You, you, you think preachers don't listen to other preachers? You're mistaken. And I listen to preachers uh, uh, not as much as I, I don't even do it near as much as I wish I did do it. And I still learn from them every time I do. Every time. If I sit and have a conversation last week, uh, I think it was last week, I sat and had a conversation with Brother Jerry Sanders. He may not know it, but he taught me something there that day. And uh, likewise, and by the way, we witnessed to a young lady there. We were in a restaurant and we witnessed this young lady and he taught me something about witnessing. I don't know whether anything I said was any good for him, but he was for me. And I'm telling you, you don't ever get done learning. So there's some pastors and then there's some and teachers and then there's some teachers. And some teachers are terrifically good teachers, not such good at pastoring. I'll never forget the time Brother E.C. Moore told me. Um, he said, yeah, I, I, I resigned the pastoring at, at the church down in Pensacola. I said, you what? He said, yeah, I resigned the pastoring. He said, they wanted a pastor. I didn't want to be their pastor. I told him, I'll be your teacher as long as you want me to be, but I'll not be your pastor. <laughs> He's the only guy that ever preached there regularly. All they wanted was a teacher. They decided they could do their own pastoral work, I think. Some people do that. They learn their part in that ministry. They may never be called a pastor, but they learn their part in it. That's the way people are. It's the way we are. So now go back to, if you will, to Titus. Look in Titus chapter one now. You see, here's the thing. In all of this patchwork of, of doctrinal books that, that Paul wrote, uh, he wrote these first six books over here. He wrote them. Uh, Sort of in that order. So if you go from Acts 16 to Acts chapter 20, you get these six books written. If you start in Acts chapter 28, the two years Paul, as it, as it mentions Paul being in prison two years there, you start right here and you go down through there and there's probably a departure from, a short departure from prison, maybe in which he wrote one or two books and then the rest, but in other words, the rest of it was completed when he went back to prison in Ephesians and 2 Timothy. So you get the time frame over here is something around like six or seven years for those books to be written. The time frame over here was, I'll say two plus that time, maybe, maybe you're upwards of three years to get the rest of the words written. Now, here's the thing. In Titus chapter one, Paul told Titus, way down here, Paul told Titus to do certain things where he had, where Paul himself had left Titus uh, to serve. Look at verse uh, four, Titus chapter one, verse four. To Titus, mine own son, after the common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou should set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Now, the word ordain has to do with placing correctly. It is so ordained. City ordinances are called, uh, city laws are called ordinances. They are ordained by a council. So the council gets their heads together and they vote uh, majority or all the way up to, to consensus and they vote for this ordinance to be written. Well, they so ordain that that the city can't do anything about it. People live in the city can't do anything about it. You want to do something about it, you put somebody else in as a counselor and have them bring it up again and rewrite it. But the point is, they do that. They are placing as needed or as should be 
a thing in the order. Now that's what ordaining is. They ordain those things. So he says to Timothy, I mean to Titus here, uh, set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. I don't know how many that was. I don't know how many cities Titus was supposed to appoint, appoint an elder in. I know that that is the instruction to do. And then he tells him what this elder should be. And it sounds a lot like a deacon. Notice it says, if it if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of, of riot or unruly. And then he says, for a bishop must be, and uh, it sounds like maybe he's talking about bishops instead of uh, um, deacons. But a bishop isn't ever much more than a deacon himself, maybe more orderly, maybe more ordering. In other words, he tells people what to do and whatever. But notice, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon, soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality. Now it looks more like a deacon than it does like, like a bishop. But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Ah, there comes the teaching again. Now, there's a thing here that is very, very, mm, I, I was going to say important, but that's not a strong enough word. This is profoundly necessary. Put it like this. It says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Well, then you'd have to know how people were taught, wouldn't you? To name an elder. In a, in a city, as Titus was told to do here, you'd have to know how he had been taught. Well, I'll tell you something. I had, uh, this, is, this happened more than once in the 36 years that I pastored churches, but only once as noticeable as this. A man wanted to be, he wanted us to have a ruling council, and he wanted to be on it. Well, I know what he wanted. He, coming from a denominational background, he wanted to be the chairman of the deacon's board. You know, the two guys that uh, that I saw that ruled the churches in denominational in the denominations were the man that was in charge of the property, and in many cases that's called a trustee, and the, the chairman of the board of deacons. Those are the two guys that told the pastor whether he could stand up or sit down, in what I saw. So this guy wanted it. It was easy to see he wanted that. When I talked to him, that's what he wanted wanted it and um, and so he asked me one time I was building a church building and I, he said is it going to be a church I said, yeah he said well I'm in a real church I said yeah real church his definition of real church and mine weren't quite the same you see there was a an elder there it was me and there was a bishop there and it was me I told the group of men more times than once, and especially the men who would come to a men's Bible class, you are, without any special ordination service, no laying on of hands or any such thing as that, you are the deacons. I mean, whether you like it or not, brethren, if you're serving in this group here, you're the men. You are the deacons. Now, I don't care whether or not they took that seriously or not, because I don't believe that it is an organization. Listen to me. I don't believe that it's an organization that has slots to fill, and you start with one guy on top, and then you come down with two here, and then you come down like that. No way. That's not the way the church, the body of Christ is. Jesus Christ is the head. Men are the men to, to uh, ordain to lead, and the Lord is holding men responsible, ladies. Now, if you don't like that, you can take that up with the Lord, but I suggest you study 1 Timothy chapter 2 real carefully. Men are held responsible by the Lord for what goes on and what is said and who is doing the saying of it. Someone asked me one time, said they told about a story about a woman going into a grace church and speaking up and standing up and speaking in tongues. 
somebody asked me, said, if a woman did that and you was up in the pulpit preaching, what would you do? And I said, I'd tell her to sit down and shut up. And if she didn't like that, she could leave. And if some man brought her there, I'd say, get up and take her out of here. You know why? That's an ungodly thing going on. That is not godly, and that is not of the Lord for that to go on in this dispensation. And you who know about rightly dividing know that that's true. And I don't care whether the rest of you pay any attention to me about that or not, but you should pay attention to the scripture. And if you think I was being rude, you'd probably be right. If someone spoke in tongues in my assembly when I was teaching a Bible class, bless your soul, they would be the rude one, not me. And I would get rid of it. I had a man who he tried to start, tried to speak about a guy, uh, an old man, I won't bring it up now, you'd probably know who it was, but he was a seer. And I said, stop, I'm not going to let you talk about that in here. He said, well, I just pointed out, I said, don't point out anything using that man as an example. I don't want that in here. And he got mad and left. Everybody thought I should go apologize. I was in a men's Bible class. I was about to let that man bring that other guy in here. I don't care whether you like me or not. Of course, I cared down deep. I've been friends with him for years, but I wasn't gonna, still wasn't going to allow that. You know why? There are some things that are sacrosanct here. The word of God is what's the, 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 the freshness and the presence of it. It's the word of God that matters. And what you do with the word of God is what matters in a group. I wasn't going to lie. I don't see anything wrong with that according to what I just read the instructions about here. Notice what he says in verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as if been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Gainsayers are arguers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped to subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And he goes on. Now I want to notice something. Oh, the, the admonition that Paul gives to the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Go back to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. He says in Ephesians chapter 4 about the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. In verse 12, he says, here's what they're for. He says, for the perfecting of the saints. That would be the people who are sitting in front of them, who are associating themselves with them and whatever. For the work of the ministry walking worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called and for the edifying of the church of the body of christ to edify the body of christ is to build it up without error verse 13 till we all come in the unity of the faith that is not the unity of the spirit it is the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of christ now watch that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. All of those problem things in verse 14 are the things we face once we are put into a position as a bishop, an elder, a deacon, a grown man in the Lord. That's what we face. We face all this idiocy, and we're supposed to lead people in a manner. And I don't mean like drag them around with a rope, lead them. I mean be as a, an example of the believer in this manner. Notice he says, verse 17, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Why? What's wrong with the vanity of the mind of most Gentiles? Well, here's the description of it, verse 18 uh, and 19. He says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Now, most of you think that has to do with some sort of worldliness that goes on out there in those dark places you don't go to at night. I'll tell you where it happens. It happens inside the churches. It's all about the building of religion, folks. Trusting in something besides the Lord Jesus Christ. Trusting in something besides the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Putting rules up. Setting parameters as to whether or not someone can join your church. 
I thank God that somewhere early on in the teaching that Brother Moore laid on me and showed me how to read this Bible, how to study by rightly dividing the word, I thank God and have thanked him often that I learned quickly that the, or, that the church is not an organization. It is an organism, but it's not an organization. It doesn't have a chart to fill, and it's not about whether or not you can find enough people. You and another saved individual, when you're together and talking about the word of God, constitute the church. Now, here's the thing. Therefore, what I learned, I never saw the need for organization. So I pastored basically two churches and a whole gob of Bible classes, and I never once had a member. Never tried to. Never had an altar call. Never tried to coerce somebody into receiving what was a free gift from Jesus Christ. Never took up an offering. We did take up offerings if we had a special need, like when someone was bad sick or someone uh, had a tra tragedy in their family and so on and so forth. We would take up special offerings that way because we wanted to identify where that money was going. But we never took up an offering for the group. Never did. Never had a budget. I was told after I built a building that I needed to put so many thousand dollars away for maintenance. I didn't have any so many thousand dollars to put away, so I didn't have any maintenance fund. And sure enough, about the third or about the sixth year, I think, of that building, it was right just after the one of the, all the air conditioner systems had gone out, uh, uh, I mean, gone out of the uh, uh, warranty, one of them quit. The guy said, if they had nothing to do but replace it, I said, okay, how much? He said, $3,600. I said, okay, figure get it, get it ordered and get it in here. We're going to need it before next Sunday. It was hot in Texas. So he said, okay. So he did. He got it in on, got it put up, put it in on a Friday, and it was running fine on Sunday morning. He told me on Friday afternoon, I'll send you the bill. I got the bill 10 days later, and on uh, uh, is either the the next day or the following days, either the 11th or 12th day after that, that a man walked up to me and handed me an envelope full of stocks, uh, certificates, and he said, you can sell these. I think it'll be right, right around $4,000. It was. It was $4,100. I only needed $3,600. See, see what I mean about the Lord? You don't have to have all this stuff. You just don't have to wring your hands over this stuff and try to beg people to give you money. So you always just get and go. Just do it. I drove to some Bible classes one time with no money to come home. home. Always came home. Ha! Barbara may not have been happy if I would stayed home, but always came home. You know why? Because the Lord provides. People don't understand how much the Lord can provide. How do you come out give God? I mean, if you hear that in all the churches, right? Then they turn around and beg you for money. Nobody needs to take up an offering. Nobody needs to beg. Nobody needs to cry out what they need. They need to just trust the Lord. I found out early on, if I wanted a thing for the ministry and it didn't come, it wasn't part of the ministry. What I was the one who wanted it. Obviously, if the Lord wanted it, it would have been there, right? Of course that's right. Of course it is. You see, we walk around like the other Gentiles. We walk around sometimes, we think, well, I'm not going to walk. I'm not going to run in there where all these people are getting drunk and dancing and all. That's not what the Lord is talking about. He's talking about the unrighteousness of their blindness. Unclean, greedy. On and on it goes. It's about religion, ladies and gentlemen not about the world. The Lord saved us in this world. He left us in this world. The Lord knows who we are. But he taught us. If we believe the word of God, he taught us that pure religion is this, that you visit the fatherless and the widows in their, in their need, and you keep yourself unspotted before the world. You want to work on pure religion? Work on that. It ain't got nothing to do with going to join in some organization somewhere. If you belong to the Lord, why would you need to belong to somebody else? Don't do that. And if you're in a church and you don't want to get out, I don't care. Stay there. But serve the Lord with gladness. Serve the Lord without the denominational system 
uh, interfering with what you're doing. Serve the Lord through his word. You see, walk not like other Gentiles. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Now, since we're talking about that, before we go back to Titus, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says to these people in, re, in reminding them of what he had done when he was there and reminding them of how the Lord had, had shown them uh, a work of faith and so forth. He says in verse 10, you are witnesses and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Watch, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe, turn now to Philippians. And notice the correlation between all of this stuff back here, and now we're over here. We're using Timothy, and, or I mean Titus and Ephesians already. I look in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. After he says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. I love that passage. But pick up in verse 11, with, I mean, verse um, 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation. It doesn't say work for, it says work out. It says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You stay in the word of God. You keep your, your mind set on the things that God is instructing you to do, and he will fulfill his good pleasure using you. Okay, walking worthy. Go back to Titus and look in Titus chapter 2 now. We read those three very important verses, 11, 12, and 13. We're going to pick up in, in 13 again and read on down. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Did you see that said zealous of good works? These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. I know he's talking to Titus. But you see, in some way, shape, or fashion, with someone that you might be dealing with, you would fit the passage. It may be a younger person. It may be someone in your family that needs help, and you're helping them through the Word of God. Or it may be someone that has presented you a question, and you know that the Word of God will show them differently, and you just set out to show them differently. You do it authoritatively, and you do it not expecting them to bring reproach towards you because of the, because of the way you handle the Word of God in front of them. Notice now... Through the passage about regeneration, read with me again verse 4, chapter 3, verse 4. He says, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our uh, Savior. Look now at these next three verses. That being justified by his grace... We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Get a grip on them, folks. Get a grip on them. Now, in a quick recap, I want you to uh, hold on to uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and go back to Roman and turn the page down or something. Go back to Romans chapter 1.
Now, I'm not saying that this is the last of the series about the first six books versus the last seven books. I'm not saying it's the last, but I'm, I'm not, I've got some other things I want to talk about, and I don't know whether to include them in this category or not. If that's something that's understandable to you, but nevertheless, we'll just see how that comes out. But here's how I want to conclude today. In the first book you come to in your Bible that Paul wrote, which is Romans, he starts off with the gospel. He says in verse 7, um, I'm in Romans 1, I, don't know, I may not have told you the chapter, Romans chapter 1, verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. I think you'll catch what I mean by that in just a moment. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Now, be careful what you think their faith was. I'm not trying to tell you how I'm going to, I'm not going to define for you what their faith was. I want you to notice what Paul said to them. You know, this morning I was reminded of a time when my father uh, was asked and went and preached a revival at a Nazarene church. And my father and the Nazarene preacher had a lot in common. And they, they were both sort of uh, fiery type preachers. And, um, and they pastored churches. But one was a separate Baptist, which didn't hold any tongue speaking or anything like that. But, but also was, and they probably wouldn't have known the terminology, but they were all millennial. They didn't believe there is a thousand year reign of Christ coming to the earth. My father said, preached for years that he didn't believe that. Okay. Well, neither did the Nazarenes. The Nazarenes would have fallen into the category of being covenant theologians. But I don't know that my father ever knew that terminology either. But anyway, he would, get, I think he did this twice, as I recall, and he, he did a revival meeting in this Nazarene church. Well, now the Nazarenes believe, and they have several things that they believe that were not like separate Baptists. And even as a young kid, I would think, how can my dad go to a Nazarene church and preach? And then I've heard him going down the road talking about this thing that they believe called the second work of grace and how wrong it was. Well, I don't see how you can do things like that. Well, I never did question my dad about it. He was my dad, after all, and I didn't know how to question him about it at the time. And later on, I never thought it was important enough to do so, um, especially after that man was passed away and, and on and on and on. But here's the thing. There was a great deal of faith involved in the way my dad performed his ministry, and I suspect there was in Mr. Decker, too. The Nazarene church would have called him Reverend Decker, but he was my sixth grade teacher, and I called him Mr. Decker. I suspect there was a considerable amount of faith involved in what he did, just as there was with my dad. But it isn't automatically the same kind of faith that you and I would have because we know, understand, hear, and believe the gospel of Christ has the power of God and salvation. So here he says in verse 8, Paul says to these Romans, First, I thank my God throughout, through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. No matter what their faith was, it was seemed to be a very well-known thing that they had faith. Verse 9, for God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son. That without ceasing, I make mention of, of you always in my prayers. And he says, I plan to be there. Now look down at verse 14. Uh, 13, I'm sorry. Now, I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am better both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as in me is, I am now, uh, um, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Paul is now ready to preach the gospel to them. 
Should you and I walk through the book of Romans believing these people had already trusted Christ as their Savior? I think we could safely say that based upon Paul's uh, acclamation of them in the first eight verses there, that we could say they believed in Jesus. I don't know what they had learned about Jesus, but I know that Paul was expecting to preach unto them the gospel of Christ and show them that's what they needed for salvation because he starts in Romans chapter one and he goes all the way through Romans chapter eight to complete the thought. And the thought is all about what is the gospel. What is the gospel? And it takes him eight chapters, starting in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Wow! Yeah. They didn't know the gospel of Christ. He's now telling them the gospel. And he takes eight chapters to tell them what the gospel of Christ has done for them. And praise God, it's the first thing you and I come to in our Bible. If we read from left to right, it's the first thing we get. All eight chapters all in a row. It's magnificent. Look in chapter 3. After explaining the world, explaining the individuals, explaining hypocrisy, and explaining who needs salvation, he says in verse 21, chapter 3, verse 21, he says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. It's not even our faith. It's his faith. The righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, is unto all and upon all them that believe. Wow. Romans. That starts this great span. When we open up our Bible, Romans starts the great gathering. It starts the great congregation. It starts the church, the body of Christ, and on and on. As far as doctrine goes in your book. Yes, it does. Romans does. Now, if you will, in 1 Timothy. Come over here to where he's written 1 Timothy, and it's during this last group. And I'm going to use green out here just to be different. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, he says some very interesting things here in the very compact spot. He says in verse uh, 3 concerning the prayers, etc., of chapter uh, 2, verse 1 and 2. In chapter 2, verse 3, he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now, remember, he's, he's gone through all of this stuff and written. The only books he's got yet to write after this one is Titus, Ephesians, and 2 Timothy. And so he says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Now watch verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Well, where do you suppose the knowledge of the truth is? It's right there. When Paul writes the second book of Timothy, he says, consider what I say in the Lord and give you understanding and everything. I just changed it a little bit. I know I changed it. Don't, don't write me letters. Uh, you can write me letters. Just don't tell me that. Notice again, uh, verse 4, God our Savior, who will have all men to, come, to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now watch carefully. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And then he says, and I'm the one doing it. Whereunto he says, I was an ordained a preacher and so on and so forth. So ordered. Paul was ordered to go tell it. And he did it. And he put it there in all 13 books. And he had to deal with the Jew first, but also to the Greek back here. 
He had to deal with what the laws, the Jews believed back here, and he couldn't violate the gospel of Christ and the freedom of it and the faith that's involved in it and the grace that's involved. He couldn't do that. But over here, he didn't have to pay attention to any of that stuff. He just wrote it all down and said, that's the way it is from now on. And you and I, we are not the recipients of just the first six books Paul wrote. We've got all 13 of them. And if we pay close attention to all 13 of them, all 13 of them, every word, every phrase, we will see God's will in our life. And it is dispensational. It is not covenantal uh, in, in any sense of the word. None of us were ever in the covenants of God. We receive grace, not a covenanted promise. I thank you for being here today. I hope it's been helpful. I hope it makes a difference to you. And uh, I, I hope it's uh, something that can be helpful anywhere down the road. I hope it is. Uh, thank you very much. See you next week. Mm -hmm.